Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurveda healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. We are back today with our Cabral House Calls. We're answering more of our community's questions each and every week, and hopefully you've been tuning in every Saturday and Sunday we are getting into what our community has on their minds in terms of helping themselves, their loved ones, their community with their health and wellness-based questions. So we go over wellness, weight loss, anti-aging. We go over mindset. We go over health coaching. Whatever it is that people are looking for a recommendation from on my end, I try to do my best. I try to share whatever I've learned with you, not hold anything back, and hopefully it just provides maybe even just a little bit of information to set you on your way to bigger and better things with your life. So I'm actually going to dive right into the show today, and the reason is that I am going to keep this at about 20 minutes for you because I'm going on to a live workshop with our integrative health practitioners right after this for IHP Mastery. Really looking forward to that live workshop we do every two weeks. So I'll be answering lots of questions then as well. Let's get right into it. First question is from Jillian. Jillian says, Hi, Dr. Paul. Love your show and love your archive. I've been able to find a podcast on nearly every health question I've had. One subject I couldn't find anything on, however, is the practice of urine therapy, aka Shivambu. Since urine therapy has its origins in Ayurveda, I was wondering if you've studied it in your travels. A friend of mine, cardiac nurse turned natural health advocate, healed herself of kidney cancer and believes urine therapy played a role in her recovery. She mentioned that urine's primary ingredient, urea, is also used synthetically in skin creams, that urokinase is used in medicine as an anticoagulant, and that urine contains all sorts of nutrients and even trace amounts of DMT. Out of curiosity, I watched a documentary called Urine Aid and even attended a small urine therapy conference. Unfortunately, it's been difficult for me to find a balanced view on the subject. People seem to either regard urine as a panacea or be too disgusted by the practice even considered its potential. Personally, I've only been brave enough to use my urine as a leave-in conditioner on my hair after washing it, with great results, by the way. Thanks so much for addressing this taboo and potentially woo-woo topic, Jillian. All right, Jillian, it's not too woo-woo for for, uh, you to be asking, so I'm happy to address this. So I've studied urine-based therapy in two ways. I've studied it in bioregulatory medicine, and I've studied it through Ayurvedic medicine. So in Ayurvedic medicine, and then today's kind of bioregulatory medicine, we actually look at the urine in multiple ways. We actually look at it in terms of specific gravity. So one test that, you know, I, I... done many, many times, is to actually put a drop of sesame oil on a basically a sample jar, a sample container of urine. And what happens to that drop is that you're able to see specific gravity. Now, of course, in my practice, I have a specific device, I won't get too much into it, that actually looks at someone's specific gravity. I also have urine dipstick, so I'm able to look at all those things, but people can do this right at home. And then, of course, too little specific gravity. I shouldn't say, of course, this is not you know <laughs> normal common knowledge testing your urine, but too low a specific gravity is often someone that is um, their blood is or and their solute is too depleted. That means they're typically going to be a lower on the mineral side that's typically more of the vato or ectomorph. And then higher specific gravity is not a good thing, especially when someone has higher blood pressure. So we can look at that. We can look at it through a urine-based test with someone's PCP. You can use urine dipsticks at home, et cetera. But urine therapy that you're talking about is a little different. That means you actually urinate into a cup and you would ingest a certain amount, usually in a small amount, not homeopathic is different. Homeopathic is dilutions. But you would actually ingest some of your own urine And people said that they've healed their body that way. So there's a couple schools of thought. And again, I have looked into this. I don't use urine therapy in my practice. However, I'm not against it. I'm against it. Let me just give the the negative. So when we urinate, we are getting rid of waste. 
Now, one of the waste markers that you talked about was urea, but I understand where you're coming from and you say this is used in certain things. Okay, understood there. However, we also get rid of heavy metals. So, you know, you do have to look at that because you are putting heavy metals. Now, again, not a huge amount, but you are putting them back in your body. So it's it's something to think about, okay? But of course, if people are using it for other therapies, well, then that might outweigh the heavy metal-based issue. Okay, so there's a few theories as to why it works, and I don't believe it's based on urea. Now, again, maybe it is, though. Maybe it is. I'm just keep I keep my mind open. What happens with urine-based therapy and what, what was thought truly by Ayurveda and many other, this is not just with Ayurveda, many other ancient-based healing modalities, is that when you take some of your own urine, it could be as small as a little pipette, a little uh, dropper, is that you're telling your body essentially what it needs, what it's gotten rid of, what it has too much of. It's an interesting theory. So basically, your body says, okay, this is what we have going on. This is how we can go about the healing-based process. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if it works. I don't have any scientific research on it, and I haven't needed it. So that's the other thing is that I, I, I believe people can get well without urine-based therapy, which is why I've just never done it in my practice. So Jillian, hopefully that's the most fair answer I can give. All right, but I don't think there's anything wrong with talking about it, right? There should be nothing wrong with talking about anything that has the potential to help someone heal. Like, that's the truth. And like, people would say, well, why even talk about it on your show? It's this and that. No, 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 no. Everything is fair game. If it's questions that people have, that's fair. Everybody should have their answer, their question answered. And that's what these house calls are all about. So do feel free to write in with any questions you have. All right, Desiree is up next. Hello, what food are best for growing strong, healthy hair? Hair is made out of protein, so would increasing protein intake by 10 grams be helpful for hair growth? Eggs have a lot of vitamins that are good for hair. Is it possible to develop a food sensitivity to eggs by eating them four to five times per week? I have no current sensitivity and no leaky gut. Desiree, let's kind of work backwards. Yes, the second to third most common food sensitivity is eggs. And there's actually egg whites, believe it or not. You can run a simple lab. It's a food sensitivity test. You can find that at equilibriumnutrition.com or with your local integrative health practitioner, level two, or your local naturopathic doctor, functional medicine doctor, et cetera. So, okay. And you want to check for an IgG sensitivity, not necessarily just an IgE. Most people don't have reactions right away when they eat eggs. It's an inflammatory-based issue that happens a day or two days later, which doesn't show up as what you might think as like, oh, this is bloating. No, it's, it always has to do with more of the subtle ones that are tied to inflammation. Brain fog, skin rashes, low mood, migraines, etc. Okay, so would increasing your protein intake by 10 grams be helpful? Well, that all depends on if you're at adequate levels right now. So if you are just your average individual, you do a little walking, maybe a little bit of movement with your body, well, you want to be at about half your weight in protein per day, about 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. So if you weigh 150 pounds, you want to be somewhere around 60 to 70 grams of protein per day. That would be adequate. That's 20 grams of protein over three meals. Most people, they don't get that. I mean, they really don't. So yes, a good first step is adding some protein to your diet. We recommend the daily nutritional support uh, first thing in the morning with a smoothie. If you wanted to add more protein to that, I would add, we have a great organic hemp protein that you can add a little bit more to it. So you can check out so many different shows I have on, on basically good quality diet. You can check out my podcast I did on my daily Mediterranean diet. Okay, then what I would do is I would add in the, so daily foundational protocol level two or level three, that's what I would do. And then I would add in the advanced collagen support and I would add in the balanced zinc because healthy hair needs zinc and it needs copper, okay? It also, using the advanced collagen support is is fantastic as well. So that's exactly what I would do. All right, Desiree, also, if you go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast, I have a bunch of podcasts for overall why people lose their hair, it starts to thin. And then I have another one on why women, specifically for why women are losing their hair. So feel free to check those out. If you ever can't find a podcast, you can ask at cabralsupportgroup.com and our great team led by Michelle will help you find that podcast. Dan is up next. Hi, thank you for all you do. You've recommended oil pulling with coconut oil to help whiten teeth. I wear retainers at night and I'm wondering if I can put coconut oil in them to whiten my teeth overnight. Have you heard of this? Can you think of any negative consequences of doing this? Thanks in advance, Dan. All right. So yes, I've recommended coconut oil pulling 
for helping to whiten the teeth. That is correct. Some people even mix a little bit of turmeric with it. And I know that sounds crazy. I did as well. I'm like, turmeric stains. Turmeric will stain a white shirt. Turmeric will, you can literally use it to paint with as part of a pigment. But it's crazy that it actually can help to whiten your teeth. Turmeric and coconut oil mixed together, or co- turmeric and baking soda. So you can do it with different things. But just coconut oil, just swishing around your mouth, and oil pulling can help as well. Putting your retainers, putting them in it in your retainers is an interesting thought. And I don't know if it break down the plastic of the retainers or the polymer or whatever it's made out of. I'm assuming it's not corrosive. I'm assuming it wouldn't do that. But I'm also assuming that you, the coconut oil will be gone from your retainer within about, I would say, I, I mean, again, I don't know, I'm guessing an hour because your saliva is going to mix with it. And then it's going to just dissolve. Basically, you're just going to consume it. You will just swallow it or it will go through your gums and those types of things. So I don't see any issue with it. But again, I don't know how it would interact with the actual material of the retainer. There's no sugar in it. So that's not going to be an issue typically for the teeth. Would I do it? Probably not. No, I would probably just swish for five minutes to 10 maximum and then spit it in your barrel, never in your sink because you want oil down the sink. And uh, hopefully that's helpful. Nicole's up next. Hi, I'm really keen to do a detox start a new nutrition plan, but I'm breastfeeding at the moment, so I'm not sure what is the best approach or if I need to make any changes to the generic detox plans on your website. What do you recommend? Thanks. Okay. I just forgot to mention today is episode 1612. So head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 1612 to read along with Nicole's question and all the others for today. So when a woman is pregnant or breastfeeding, we do not recommend a detox. However, you could follow along with what is able to be done, which is a shake in the morning, a plant-based lunch, a shake mid-afternoon, and then a paleo-style dinner at night, whether it's vegan or paleo. It's totally your choice. So that would work, Nicole. We're not recommending a specific detox, but you're absolutely able to do that. You can also follow the daily foundational protocol level two or level three, and um, that will work great as well. So you just wouldn't do the two days of fasting. So with the seven-day detox, the first two days are the four shakes a day. Very specific. They're not just like a slim fast shake. <laughs> People often ask, can I just mix this shake in? I'm like, no, no, it doesn't work that way. There's very specific B vitamins, vitamin C, there's uh, glutathione, there's detox factors in it. It's very specific that to allow you to, for your, it's all it is, is essentially I always try to simplify things. It is nutrients for your liver, specific ones for phase one and phase two. If you've never heard about, I mean, literally one of the most important topics in the world for your health, liver detoxification, just go to equilibriumnutrition.com forward slash detox dash course. And that's a completely free course that I did for you. It's a couple hours long that will teach you the science behind a functional medicine detox. And you can choose any detox in the world that you want, but you'll know which one to choose and there are multiple based on the nutrients that your body needs. I mean, it is the number one recommendation for you right now, without a doubt, for everybody. And of course, when you're breastfeeding, well, it has to be different. You can't do a detox while you're trying to give life, right? You don't want to be pulling these things out of the body. Okay. Tim's up next. Hi, Dr. Ball. I'm a devout listener of yours and admire the work that you do. I've heard many times over the podcast about your own health history. I'm in the same boat as you regarding Addison's POTS hypocortisolism, et cetera. I've tried searching through the search bar to see if I can find out how you were able to reverse your POTS and get off hydrocortisone. My doctor has been, has B, be, I think that's supposed to say me on Florinef for low aldosterone and low blood pressure. And I just started me on five milligrams of HC, which I believe you're talking about is hydrocortisone. I don't like the idea of steroids. I have tried your adrenal energy two in the morning, one in the afternoon. I've done an adrenal saliva test, but I feel as though I barely gets me through the day. My POTS symptoms have recently come back. I hate to increase Florinef because I'm already on 0.2. I have already done heavy metals, organic acids, mycotoxins, and ZRT saliva. Is there anything else I'm missing? The fatigue and POTS are becoming almost debilitating. Thank you so much. Hopefully, by the time you answer this, I would have found a solution, but I would love to hear what you've done. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate that. And I also appreciate the blessings. <laughs> the more, the better if you could confer on me. So here's the thing. I, I mean, I, this is like, right, this is like reading, reading my own previous biography. 
Addison's disease, POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. For anybody who doesn't know what that is, it's, I mean, it's absolutely debilitating. You basically stand up, you feel like you're going to pass out, you get lightheaded, you have brain fog, you walk up a flight of stairs, your heart starts beating 150 beats per minute without even exercising. Hypercortisolism is essentially the same thing as Addison's, but not disease state. You just don't produce enough cortisol, which means, again, you have brain fog. You never feel like you wake up. You're a zombie. I used to be a zombie until about 11 a.m., and then finally I'd wake up a little bit, and then I'd want to sleep by mid-afternoon, and then at night when it was time for bed, I was wide awake. It was a miserable existence because then I'd have insomnia all night, so I wouldn't be able to sleep, but I needed to sleep in order to get well. So, Tim, I'm pretty sure that's probably what you're dealing with is it's called uh, dysautonomia, and your autonomic nervous system is is in disarray. I equate it to holding like the tip of a pencil. So if I hold just the tip of that pencil and you come by and you flick that pencil, it's going to fall out of my hand or it's going to wave and waggle all over the place. I can't control it. So a regulated autonomic nervous system, you're holding that pencil right in the middle. And then what happens is if someone goes to hit it, well, it doesn't really move that much because it's strong. It's regulated. So Tim, if I had the pill or the thing for Addison's or Potts, I would give it to you. There's, I wouldn't hold back. There's no doubt about it. What we have to do is we have to follow the de-stress protocol that I wrote about in the Rain Barrel Effect. And the Rain Barrel Effect, just coming up on two-year anniversary of that, just passed actually, it is a book that I try to sell for the least amount of money possible, and all profits go to charity. And it is exactly how I got well, and I've helped many thousands of other people. So what is it? Well, it's following specific diet. So we make sure that you're not low carb, that it's exercise, that you're not over exercising, that you're just doing the minimum, that it's stress reduction, huge. I mean, I mean that's going to be like number one, right, for you, number one or number two. It's going to be toxin removal, but no big fasting because that's going to drop you, again, into more of a stress state. So you really can't fast when you have Addison's. Then it's, we talked about rest of the sleep overnight, getting nine hours, right? You need to be on more towards eight to nine hours and you need to be getting deep sleep. I mean, are you getting an hour and a half of deep sleep a night? Are you getting two plus hours of REM a night? Are you tracking it? And then the emotional balance, that's huge, right? Is there any unresolved trauma that you need to fix that's, that's holding you back? Are you playing the role of the victim? And again, if you were, I would understand. I would get it. I was there too, but you're not going to get well doing that. And then there's supplement protocols. You need to fortify that body with methylated B vitamins, vitamin C. Herbs are great, but a lot of people are sensitive you know, to them as well. But get those nutrients in, get enough protein for your body, don't use all of your energy for digestion. Smoothies are enormous. Same with cooked foods for that for the type that you're at right now. Get enough sea salt in at each meal. Um, don't overdo the potassium. Make sure it's in balance with the sodium for the pots. And then, of course, there is the success mindset, right? So it's all of that. It's the de-stress protocol. Everybody can read about it in the Rain Barrel Effect. And uh, Tim, you know, is written for people like you and, and many other people that are struggling right now. You'll find your answer, Tim. You'll be there. Hey, I was on, I was on Cortef, which is hydrocortisone. I was on Florinef as well. I mean, that's like me going in a time warp, right, from, from uh, many years ago when I was on those particular pharmaceuticals. And we all do what we have to do. And and I'm not saying to come off of them. What I'm saying is you'll work with your doctor, you'll start to get well, and hopefully you'll be able to wean along with your doctor to do that. So I wish you the best, Tim. I know I'm going to hear your success story soon. It takes a little while to get well, but you'll do it. And again, just keep on keeping on. That's what it's all about. All right, one more question for today. Michelle's up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I listen to all your amazing podcasts in addition to my IHP training. And I don't fully understand the underlying cause of high cholesterol. After doing the big five, completing the CBO in the finisher, following the diet and supplements, including daily thyroid, omega-3 for almost a year now, I feel the best I've ever felt in my life, and I thank you all for that. But my latest blood work still shows high cholesterol. Same as last year, actually went up slightly, and the HDL went down slightly. And I just can't figure this mystery out. The irony is that with all your teachings, I've been helping so many people get well and feel amazing, transforming their health, and yet... I find many people of all ages also have high cholesterol. I feel so bad having it myself and not knowing how to dig deeper into understanding why they have it too. You mentioned you've seen people's numbers change, and I was wondering if you can do a course or a podcast series on the root cause of this, as it is so common. I appreciate you so much. You're the best teacher I've ever had, and I would love your help in solving this. Thank you, Michelle. 
Michelle, I'm, I really appreciate this question. I appreciate the kind words, of course, that you are bestowing upon me. So here's the thing. There really is, like, again, at 18 years old, I'm having my blood work done for the first time in many, many years. And I have high cholesterol well over 220. And I have low HDL. It was a 29. A 29 at 18 years old. Thought I ate well. I exercise. I play sports every single season. Like, what's going on here? So it obviously goes well beyond diet and exercise. So you need to be doing the diet. You need to be doing the exercise. But what gives? Well, some people don't process high saturated fat very well. So again, you can eat a healthy diet, and it can have a lot of saturated fat. So please go back and check out my episode 1601, and also on wow 1601. Oh, and 1608. All right. So check those out as to saturated fats. Some people just can't process them well. Is it everyone? No, but it's about 22 to 26% of the population. I happen to be one of them. That's why I'm sharing this with people, right? I can't do a ton of saturated fat. I have some, I just can't do a ton. Certainly omega-6s, omega-3s play a part of it. So do, and a lot of people overlook this, higher levels of stress hormones, okay? Because your body will ramp up production. 80% of your cholesterol is predominantly made by the liver anyway, and it will ramp up production. So here's what I'm going to do. This fall... And into the winter, early 2021, I'll be creating courses, small courses on individual health-based topics that will be about three hours long. And I will teach you all of the underlying root causes as to why these things happen. Explore them for yourself. Remember, most diseases of the body happen because of six to 12 main reasons. That's it. I mean, it seems like maybe that's a lot. It's not. And you could work through those, and I will give you the sequence and order of events to figure out what the underlying root causes are, and then you know, you know forever for the rest of your life what was causing it. So, Michelle, thank you for bringing this up. I'm definitely going to do one on high cholesterol. So, again, these aren't treatment protocols. They are true underlying root causes, and I hope that this helps. So, thank you, everyone. I appreciate you. I'm off to our IHB workshop right now. I hope you've had a great weekend, and be sure to tune in tomorrow as we do our Mindset and and motivation Mondays. Ever wonder what the best sauna, blue blockers, sleep trackers, wake lights, salt lamps, or other health gadgets are? Or what about the top non-toxic mattresses, sheets, soaps, bath products, toothpaste, and cookware? Or would you like to know the cleanest choices for hemp hearts, meal delivery services, supplements, and much more? I personally curated, researched, and now created a resource page of all of my top picks that continues to grow each week. These are the exact products I use in my own life, with my family, in my private practice, and they're the ones I trust. To find out all of my up-to-date recommendations and all the details, simply head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash resources.